whatever it was going down the rollers. We did finish that one? Okay. Uh, the, the trickiest part of that one was realizing that the, uh, uh, because of the no-slip condition, that's on both sides of the rollers, both where the rollers contact the ground and where the slab contacts the rollers. And so uh, you can relate the speed of the rollers themselves to the speed of the slab, and also for the uh, potential energy, gravitational potential energy part, uh, the slab actually goes twice as far as the rollers do. So, good, I guess we're okay on that one. Bless you. All right, so the last little part here that we've got to do is, uh, again, the uh, the, this motion business that we're putting together. Only uh, remember that uh, just like we did with particle motion, we had three different ways to solve problems. The uh, classic uh, Newton's laws part, that's very good for problems that have either constant forces or constant acceleration, but it works for, uh, uh, could work for uh, forces that uh, change, I guess, but it's not as easy as the other ways to do it. Uh, we had that with that also, though, the uh, rotational equivalent of that, if you would. So that was one way to solve our general motion problems. Then the uh, next one was the work energy equation, and that we got on Friday. Uh, that doesn't come in a completely different form. Uh, mostly uh, the, the concern was that you, uh, for the rotational kinetic energy, it just goes in as the, one of the kinetic energy terms. And uh, the rest of it, for the most part, is the same. And then we'll do the impulse momentum method now for, uh, for uh, both uh, types of motion that we can then put together. So this will be for rigid body. So the translational part, of course, still holds. Then we uh, take it a step farther, look at the time rate of change. And if we assume the masses are constant, then it's only the time rate of change of the velocity. Um, but if the masses aren't constant, the time rate of change of the product of the two. This then, of course, is dvdt. And if we move things around a little bit, we get the differential form of the impulse momentum equation. But the integral form for us does a little bit better. So we integrate uh, between any two times. and any two velocities, and then we can get the, uh, the impulse momentum form for translation. We had this in uh, Physics 1. We, it's no different than what we had for the uh, uh, what we had for the uh, uh, translational part of the particle mechanics. No difference with, with anything that we've got here. And with constant mass, then uh, it just comes out to be M delta V. If we want to be, I guess, a little more complete, we can just say change in the linear momentum. So that's just review. That was the particle motion part that we had uh, before. But of course, we've got a rotational part to go with that now, because not only are these things moving, uh, but they also have to turn. And it's both of those that we need to take care of. So it starts from very much the same place, only with angular momentum rather than linear momentum. 
And then we pretty much go through the very same steps that we did there. Take the time rate of change of that. And if we assume constant moment of inertia, then uh, we get that term. And remember that uh, like every part of the rotational part we've been doing, um, we generally initially refer to it around the center of mass. We can refer to it around other points, and this is true for this as well. Uh, but as long as these two subscripts match, you're always going to be okay with whichever point you generally prefer to use. And then we can go through the very same steps we did there. And we get then the differential form. And then integrate it. And we get then both a translational impulse momentum form and a rotational impulse momentum form. Remember that the left hand side is the area under the time diagrams of either of the momentums. Uh, I guess the only change, just to be a little more complete, is that uh, this is actually the sum of all the forces, and this is the sum of all the uh, moments being uh, applied as well. That's what's good. Actually, that's, yeah, that's not the forces. Where would I need the sum? The sum would have been down here. Uh, so we don't really want the sums in there. Is that what you're going to say, Chris? This was the h dot. Is huh? That, is that is that h supposed to be dotted in the integral? The top right. Here. Yeah. Okay, but we don't need a, a sum on any of those. up to uh, a chance to do a couple problems. So we'll do, do a, a few without any particular translational part, and then we'll do one with translation and rotation. So our classic pulley and force problems. So we've got a 20 pound disc, uh, 
with a radius of 7.5 feet and an applied torque as well as as well as that force being there. Uh, applied torque of four foot pounds. <coughs> Starting from rest, find then the angular speed after two seconds. <coughs> so even though all the forces and the moments are constant, not a function of time, the fact that the problem has a time component in it can indicate that it might be worth using the impulse momentum method. In this case, it'll be pure rotation. If we actually had a weight here, uh, we'd have to do a, a translational impulse momentum on it as well, but it'll suffice for us to just use the uh, angular momentum part here. So, after two seconds, put that time rate of change of the angular momentum is that sum of the moments part. And so it's simply a matter then of putting in the moments and integrating those between two times. And that's going to cause then a change in the uh, uh, angular momentum. Okay, so got all the parts. All we're looking for is this last little bit. Solve for the omega-2. And since it's a two-dimensional problem, we don't really need to consider the uh, vector, full vector form. It'll suffice just to put a plus or a minus on the direction of rotation and the direction of the moment. So take a second and knock that one out. The weight of the uh, of the pulley, the weight of the wheel. What's the moment on your shoulder? Top of your head. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Can you tell me? So I have to. What would you do? So I don't have to go for it. <laughs> for a uniform disc, like we take that to be, since uh, if you're given. The radius of gyration, it generally is telling you that it's not a uniform disc. It's a disc uh, with a, maybe a hub and a rim or something. Um, but for just a uniform disc, it's one half mr squared. So then the only part that we don't have is the uh, is the i uh, sorry is the omega two that we're looking for. bit of a warm-up one. Got all the pieces. Just make sure you take into account the fact that there are two moments being applied to that. Both the moment from probably some kind of motor and the uh, moment due to the weight.
Not currently there's not, no. <coughs> now there is. Ten pounds. And if that was uh, also subject to time, uh, you just have to complete the inner roll. We'll do one of those in a second. Group chat straps. The inner day. Some of the moments, integrate them with time, which is easy, they're all constant in this. And then that's equal to IG omega 2. Some of the moments, they're both in the same direction. So that's a, a fairly easy integral to do. And then you can find that omega 2. Watch your units. Watch your units. A million time. I hope it's on this end of the Well, so you know, yeah, you 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 make units easy. You don't even put them in at all. Can I do that again? Yeah, well, don't, don't, no need to go to inches at all. There are no inches in the problem with that. That's in feet, that's in feet. So your problem is elsewhere, but it's with your units. I bet. Remember, you're given the weight of the disc, but here we need mass. And the easiest thing to do is just to leave the units just like that because they're going to cancel out again anyway. Don't change it to slugs or pound mass or any of those things. It makes no sense. And then that's the number that you need in over here. The 20 divided by 3. Uh, by 32, 2. Did you do that part, Travis? No. No. Chris, you have something? Uh, yeah, I think that's not that. Yep. So, watch your units on these, as always. It's going to be on your headstone, Travis. Didn't watch the units. Finally caught up with it.
using that mass. Uh, I don't have to have that written down, but I do have to have this so you can check it. 175. And that's pounds, feet, seconds. Second squared. Second squared. Just leave it like that. Don't bother going to slugs or pounds of mass or anything else. Just leave it like that because they're going to come, it comes right out in the wash anyway when you put it back in the equation. And remember this big M is the moment, some applied moment, motor or brakes or something. I guess it would be brakes on um, the direction it's turning. Tom, okay. <coughs> Alan? Doing fine. Starting from rest, we want to find how long it takes to get the motor up to uh, a steady state speed of 600 RPM. So, 
this is 10 kilograms, has a radius of gyration about its own center of 200 millimeters. and a radius of 250 millimeters. And that comes because it's uh, uh, not a uniform solid disc. It has uh, some distribution to its mass somehow. And then the smaller gear to which uh, the motor is attached is three kilograms, radius of gyration, 80 millimeters, and a radius of its own, I don't need a G on those, a radius of its own of 100 millimeters. <coughs> simply because they're not, it's not a uniform disc. And the applied moment, six newton meters. Applied to the disc, we'll put it in this direction. All right, with that set up, we want to find the time to get the motor to 600 RPM. And uh, the motor's attached directly to the smaller gear there. So again, generally the very same ideas, it's just that uh, we have to take into account the, the change in momentum of both of the gears. Since they're gears, that automatically makes it a no-slip condition between the two, which is, of course is important to us. Again, it's pretty much the same thing. Might as well start with the motor. Uh, if you want, we can label A and B if that'll help, or just do them separately on the paper somehow. But uh, again, it's uh, the time component. find there because that will integrate out as a since the moments are constant. <coughs> assuming this motor moment is constant. Okay, so you can set that up first for the uh, the little gear B. Remembering that it's trying to drag the big gear around to a start itself.
take the moment to be constant so that uh, that force there we can also take to be constant. You don't need the R in there. Yeah. It's just 2 pi radians per revolution, and then yeah, something, something yeah, and then one minute for right. seconds. Maybe I'll give you less to work on. That 600 RPM is 62.8 oh, yeah, uh, radians per second. Not by a factor of 10, I had 6.28. Yeah, well, you had the radius in there as well. Which was the point 0.1, yeah. so they integrate out easily. So, uh, which way did I have to be positive? Okay, so in the direction of the moment I have to think it's positive, so it'll be M minus F RB. We don't know what F is, but we do know what the moment is. We don't know what, uh, and we do know what the radius is, of course. And these integrate out, so the time part just becomes delta t. So just doing that, just doing the left-hand side, we have two unknowns. The delta t, which we're supposed to find, and the force that one gear exerts on the other, which we're not asked to find, but we may need to. And then that's going to be related to the startup of the small gear. IGB we can find because we know the radius of gyration of the gear B and the delta omega is starting from rest and needs to get up to this speed, so we've got that side of it. So we have one equation and the two unknowns, F and delta T. So we need another equation. unknowns. We don't need to find F, but it is an unknown, so we still need another equation. Whether we find it or not, it just depends on how we eliminate things from the uh, system of equations that we'll get. So where's another equation? Yeah, Phil's checking in his notes. Maybe he has one from yesterday. One equation, two unknowns. No delta omega for me as well. Yeah, because we're trying to get the motor up to 600 RPM from rest. So it's got to go from zero to that speed. So there's the delta omega for B right there. Won't be the same for the big disk but it's the uh, inverse of the radiuses. I forgot how to get IGB using those two numbers. In general, it's that. So we're 
where's the second equation? Yeah, you, you've got to go where the F as one of the unknowns leads you, and that leads you to disk A. And so it's got a moment on it caused by the very same force in the opposite direction. So this force is um, disk, uh, gear A on B or B on A, same either way. So you can set up the very same thing for uh, for gear A. Same thing for A, that'll also involve F and delta T. This one has an interesting solution step you're going to have to take that. Uh, really speed okay. things up. If you, if you don't take it, you should still solve for everything. It just gets more difficult. Positive moments in the direction it's going to go. So that's F R A delta T. That's the applied impulse on gear A. Since the moments are forces are constant, that integrates out to simply that, and then that's going to equal. That's actually the velocity of the, uh, the contact point.
50%, assuming no slip, which is the point of gears. So if they can slip, they don't do as often as a belt might. part of the solution is that you can solve this part for F delta T. And then that you can stick directly into there and we don't need to separate F from delta T. When you put it in there then you have delta T and the final Linear uh, rotational velocity, angular velocity, and you can finish it. So it just speeds up the solving of that system of equations if you do it that way. Just leave the F and the delta T actually looks like it says fat. Solve for that. I think you can solve them separately, but we don't need F, so that just eliminates it right away. Just that quick to get rid of it. easiest uh, other way to go through the algorithm. <coughs> Is it working? Let's see if I have that F delta T. Yeah, I do. You get 40.2 Newton seconds for that, and the units should work out. Yeah, for those units.
Yeah, for omega 2a, I have 25.1. comes from the no-slip condition here. Phil, what do you got? Well, what's that? See, omega-2b was given. We want to get it up to 600 RPM, which is this many radians per second, that is omega 2b. So there. Use that to find omega 2a, which you need right here. More minutes, maybe. Alan, you stuck somewhere? No, 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 I kind of went off on a tangent, but I can catch it. You? I can catch it. No. Because I have this. Phil? radius? Yeah. yeah, that's easy to do too because all we have here is F delta T from the second equation. But he's got the radius in there. Going into it. 
All right. Well, take a little time if you need it. Double check that if you're still struggling with it. Come see me. But you should get about 0.871 seconds. You got that two tone? All right. So we've got several of us in I've gotten that. Okay, Chris, find your mistake. Okay. All right, easy enough since those don't actually translate. So let's go to one that translates and rotates and put the whole thing together. compound wheel pulley things. Looks like it's going downhill. No. With a force being applied to it that varies with time. seconds and then there's got to be some conversion thing in there, newtons per second, just to make the units work. Mass of 100 kilograms. The individual radiuses, that's 0.4. That's 0.75 meters. And the radius of gyration about its center, 0.35. So I've got this time varying force being applied, T is in seconds, assuming no slip as usual. Find the angular speed after five seconds. general idea is just this time is not pure rotation. There's also uh, translation with it. So this one's got a little more, a little bit more to it. can't do that because that's what the force is at the end but it varies with time right. at zero seconds it's only 10 and then it goes up to 15 but it varies with time so remember we're doing intervals with respect to time the mass 
the whole thing, or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's the whole thing. You've got the radius of gyration. <coughs> so you launch it uh, the same way, I guess. Start with uh, what we've got that gets us closest to omega. And that's the integral of the sum of the moments with respect to time. It's going to get this thing rolling. Starts from rest, so we're just trying to find the uh, angular speed after five seconds. It's called omega two. So some of the torques. There aren't any unknowns in there, you can finish it right through. If there aren't any unknowns, oh, I hate when you said that. Sure. Just be careful when you sum the torques. What do you think? Something in the torques. Uh -huh. get too much farther, let me help you with this one. Obviously, it's got a torque applied to it due to the varying force P. It varies with time. But there's also a torque being applied to it by friction along the bottom. If that wasn't there, then uh, it wouldn't rotate nearly as much as it does. It would slide and rotate a little bit. The thing is, this also varies with time. So you're going to have to integrate that as well. So the sum of the torques over five seconds is P that varies with time times uh, the little r, we call one r, little r, the bigger one, big r, I guess. And then the torque due to the friction in the opposite direction. Oh, actually in the same direction, aren't they? With respect to g. So, sorry, that's a plus there. F friction force, of course, has to do with the moment, but in this case, the moment is just equal to the weight. If there is an angle to that P, then, uh, then the normal force would vary with time as well. So do we need to go over 
Sorry? You mean coefficient of friction? Well, maybe. If you need to find that, yeah, you'll need the coefficient of friction. And occasionally, I admit, I do forget some things, but not this time. No coefficient of friction. Which means you can find this, solve this without it. This is the impulse momentum equation for rotation. This wheel is not just in rotation, it's also in translation. So do the impulse momentum equation for translation, and one part of that is going to be the integral f dt. And so you don't need to actually solve the integral, you can substitute it and eliminate it. I G 
omega 2 since omega 1 is 0. Normally it equals Ig delta omega, but if omega 1 is 0, then it just equals omega 2. Chris, you're struggling because John's not here to do better than that. Or you got it already. About F. Well, because it's no slip right now. Yeah, no slip. So I don't see how keeping any block is not slip. You don't see what? How can P90 block if it's not slipping? Because if P equals F, it wouldn't accelerate. It's slipping, but there it's not slipping, but it is turning. So if P equals F and it started from rest, it'd stay at rest. So there's a, a little, I guess, a portion uh, during which P would equal F, but then, well, no, it it just, it, there's no slip. It would always show the radi radiuses to each other. P to F is just the ratio of the radiuses. Maybe. I don't know. You don't need it. You can eliminate it from the translational impulse momentum equation. Well, that's the rotational part. The translational, also integrating 0 to 5 seconds, it's just P. This time it's minus F because they're in opposite directions, dt. And then right from there, you can get the integral f dt and solve for it directly and put it in here and then find omega 2. Uh, equals then the, uh, the linear momentum. V2 because again V1 is zero. <clears throat> P and F were equal, that integral would just be zero and the delta V would be zero. Make sense, Joe? Second equation will have V2 in it. The first equation has omega 2 in it, so you'll also need that to tie the two together. change in angular momentum. 
I guess what I'm doing is trying to figure out the substitution down there. Well, it's almost done for you. You can separate these two integrals. By doing that, right? Yeah. And then equals m r omega 2, just using the no slip condition. Oh, that's not supposed to be squared. It's supposed to be 2. And then this you can solve for that as a whole unit, and then put it in there. Oh, you can I... do all this part. Well, it'll be a function of omega 2, but then you solve that last bit for omega 2. Because this is just a constant when you finish it. That's a constant, but omega 2 is unknown. So when we put it in here, we're putting in uh, a constant <coughs> plus a term with omega 2, and then you solve for omega 2. The angular, angular velocity. For which part? For this right here? Yeah. That, that no slip condition is yeah, based on that. That the velocity is equal to the uh, r omega. So it's, it's got to be the distance between the center the velocity of the center of mass and this contact point. So that's the big R, the 0.75 for, for this part right here. So if your P of T was like a rope or something, then it wasn't slipping, you can put the R in there, right? If P of T was what? Yeah. It's not slipping either. Uh, if I guess it, yeah, if you wanted to relate the speed of the rope to the uh, angular speed, but the speed of the rope. greater than is the speed of the wheel itself. But that for that you need both radiuses because it's that total distance down to the contact point. Got it? Get an R somewhere. 
the little radius only came into the problem once at all when it was back here. Everything else is based on the big radius.